So I'm seeing a lot more lower levels of testosterone in younger men. And I want to get your thoughts on what is optimal age-based testosterone levels. So there's a lot of stuff going on with the younger generation now. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. I sound like an old fart when I say that. But, um, you know, my, my wife, uh, Dr. Marianne Brandon, is a psychologist and sex therapist and writes, she has a blog on uh, psychology today, uh, which is called Future of Intimacy. And she's really interested in how sex tech is affecting younger folks, especially, mm-hmm. and what effects that's going to have on, on relationships. So first of all, the numbers of uh, individuals, young individuals by age 30 who have never had, this is in the Washington Post the other day, who have never had a sexual partner by age 30 has been fairly constant for like decades. And then I forget what year this was, but it's like in the last five or seven years, the number has skyrocketed. It used to be about 10% if I remember the numbers right. Now it's like 17%. It's a big difference. Why? Because people are into their devices and social stuff. Maybe it's COVID. I don't know if there's a lot that's going on. And sexuality is changing. Porn is like something that, that people from my generation never could have conceived when we were teenagers looking at Playboy magazine and thinking we'd struck it rich, right? Yeah. Like, like, you had to find a magazine oh, and hide it somewhere. And- so it's, not, it's not just porn, but now we have VR porn and like the, the experience of all this is un. And then we add to that some data that is suggestive that testosterone levels are going down, sperm numbers are going down, and we got a problem. Mm -hmm. Now, why that's happening, the usual answer is it's environmental uh, factors, right? And there was a scary story the other day about how uh, we all have these uh, nanoplastics Mm -hmm. running through our bloodstreams and Unstudied, right? Like who even knows what the significance yeah. of that is? They did like a study of like eight men and found uh, eight testicle biopsies and found some microplastics yeah. in them. But it's eight, right? It's a small number. We don't know yet. Yeah. We don't know, know what that means. Yeah. yeah. But it was eight out of a small number that had it that had it done, right? Yeah. So, you know, is it global warming and testicles? You know, before I before I sort of became better known for testosterone than anything else, I was a male infertility guy. And I had a laboratory and a I had a PhD working for me, and we were looking at the effect of temperature on the testis. Mm -hmm. And people say, what's your research about? And I used to joke that I would have these rats running around the laboratory, either in boxers or in... (laughs) in (laughs) But but actually the way we did it is we would anesthetize them and we'd expose their lower halves, including their their testicles and their scrotum into into hot water baths, warm water baths. They weren't hot. But um, core body temperature in centigrade is 37 degrees is lethal to making sperm. That's why our testicles are outside our body. That's why it has to sit outside the body. And even variations in a couple of degrees centigrade, a couple of degrees Fahrenheit is enough to alter the ability of the testicles to make sperm. You know, this global warming affecting things is the type of underwear that men um, wear affecting things or the, or the cut of their trousers. There's an amazing story of a guy named Richard Brindley, mm-hmm. who was this uh, uh, English physiologist and who became known for a couple of things. But one of the things that in, uh, he did a lot of self um, experimentation. And the question is about what happened to testicular temperature over the course of a day. And he implanted in his own scrotum a, a continuous reading thermometer. And he measured and documented the temperature in his scrotum over the course of 24 hours as he was standing clothed, sitting, clothed, lying down, clothed. And the same when he was naked, the same with different types of underwear. What happened when he slept? What happened when he was started walking around? <laughs> it was fantastic. And at the end, 24 hours, he took that thing out and he had his data on one individual, but what amazing data, right? Yeah. Human individual. I can just see already people are going to be like, how can I do this? Right. <laughs> and so, you know, so... You know, I've I've looked uh, not terribly intensively at the data around the sperm numbers and also testosterone numbers and how they seem to be declining over time. And I think it's certainly um, plausible that it may be true, but I don't know for sure. You know, when you were looking at data over many decades and we're comparing things to the 1940s, 1950s, there can be a lot of differences in techniques and things like that, or even how those samples were preserved. Um, 
uh, and whether or not there may be some deterioration over time that leads to just a little bit of a question mark. But it's plausible. And then the question is, what could be doing it? Because if it's happening, it's happening all over the world. Mm -hmm. At least in industrialized countries where they have data on things like testosterone values or mm -hmm. sperm numbers. And uh, so it's got to be something that's affecting all of us. Yeah. And what could that be? So temperature could be something. Could it be stress? I don't know. I would think it's pretty clear that people are more stressed and have more input and stimuli coming into their heads mm -hmm. today than they did 50 years ago before we had Twitter and Instagram and, and yeah. whatever else. Yeah, smartphones. So, yeah, so I don't know. Well, I, I guess my question also is, if you have a 45-year-old guy and his testosterone is 350 versus a 70-year-old guy and his testosterone is 350, how should we treat those men differently? I don't know that you do. So this age-related criteria for whether or not somebody deserves treatment is interesting. A lot of it comes from advocacy for younger individuals who would say, well, why if, if 300 or 350 is the number, and we're using it for all men, including old men, for a young guy, shouldn't I be comparing myself to other young guys, mm -hmm. right? Where the numbers should be 400, 450, 500 on average. And there's an argument that that's reasonable. I always worry about the older guys <laughs> who um, who can get screwed if they're being compared to their compatriots. So I wear glasses now. I had perfect vision until in my 40s. Now I wear glasses, and thank God I do. But here's the thing. So to be lower is, in terms of kind of research or medical or statistical terms, you usually, to be low on something, you have to be more than two standard deviations away from the mean, the average. My vision is not two standard deviations below the mean for people my age. Mm -hmm. I know a lot of people have much, much worse vision than I do, but it helps me read. Yeah. But if we were rigid about eyeglasses, I wouldn't have. I wouldn't be allowed to have glasses. If we were in a system where glasses was something you needed to yeah, go through health right. insurance, sure, or whatever. sure. And so for testosterone treatment, if you take a seventy-year-old guy, for him to be low compared to other seventy-year-olds, they have to be incredibly low. Yeah. And so we would be depriving a lot of people. And here's the other thing: is that especially when you look at free testosterone. Um, the symptoms are the same at 35 and 75 if you have low levels of testosterone. Where it gets crazy is that total testosterone is impacted by SHBG. SHBG rises with age. Yep. And so you have a lot of older guys who may have a somewhat decent total testosterone, but they're androgen deficient. The real question you're getting at is whether or not there is an absolute value for testosterone below which people are symptomatic and deficient and would benefit from treatment, or is it more of like a sliding scale, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Where younger guys maybe should have more testosterone. And what it comes down to partly in answering that is really a um, an interesting question that has not been answered, which is whether or not the symptoms of testosterone really are um, on that kind of sliding scale. So like it's, let's, let's just use total testosterone and say that it's reasonably reflective of what's what, right? Sure. So is a guy at 500, which is a very normal number, we, we normally talk about sort of the normal range, uh, let's say 300 to 1,000. Okay, sure. let's just yeah. use that. Um, so is somebody better off at 900 than they are at 700? I would say too, they're not. Is somebody better at 700 than at 500? On the whole, I would say too, they're not, whether they're 35 or 75. Mm -hmm. Where it gets tricky is that there becomes a, I think of it as a threshold, a number below which people start becoming deficient. Mm -hmm. And that deficiency can be mild, moderate, severe. But once you hit normal, whatever that is for your body, you're fine. So there are a lot of, I, I use plants and water <laughs> as, <laughs> as an analogy for a lot of things with testosterone. If you have a house plant, there's a, a, a fairly broad range of how, mu, how wet the soil can be where that plant is happy and healthy. But there's a point at which where it's deficient in water, where it's dry, at which that plant starts to shrivel. And I think the same is true for testosterone in people. And that's why you can have um, uh, two healthy men 
who have very different total testosterone levels within the normal range, and you cannot detect any difference between them for strength or libido or bone density or anything you want mm -hmm. because they're normal. Yeah. And so um, I think I don't have a, a, a hard answer for you, but, but I have a, a, a strong suspicion that these kinds of sliding scales based on age are probably not reflective of how the, bio, the body works. Do you think that, I mean, because we can't measure the androgen receptor sensitivity mm -hmm. to testosterone, do you think people individually have different set points? They do, absolutely. Yeah. So first of all, it's really important to understand that people, you know, we do a lot of animal research. Those animals, by and large, are clones of each other. They're identical twins. They're, everything is the same. Humans aren't like that. Yeah. So we have a ton of variation between us just on a normal basis, right? Like where do people put, if people gain weight, some people put on in different parts of their bodies, right? It's, it's sort of genetically based. Mm -hmm. It's different. Yeah. Um, now, the androgen receptor, that's a sophisticated question. So the androgen receptor is what testosterone binds to. And cells that have androgen receptor are able to use testosterone. And it's many, many, many different cells. But the androgen receptor itself can have genetic differences. Mm -hmm. And it's been well demonstrated that the androgen receptor sensitivity corresponds with what are called CAG repeats, the sort of these, these chemical elements that get repeated over and over again in their DNA. Mm -hmm. And uh, if I have this right, the more repeats they have, the less sensitive it is. And the fewer repeats, the more sensitive it is. Could be opposite, but I think that's the right. Sure. Thing. But the d point is, is there are some people who have medical conditions Mm -hmm. where they have normal testosterone levels, but their body presents as if they're extremely deficient. And it's because their androgen receptor is different. If you enjoyed this clip of the Rena Malik MD podcast, make sure you check out the full episode with Dr. Abraham Morgenthaler right here.